Chapter Thirteen of The Caves of Fear by John Blaine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Thirteen: The Black Buddha. Long ago, according to the tale Chada had heard from his Indian Buddhist friends in the monastery, a high lama and some of the chief priests of Corsa Lincoln forsook their vows and went in for piracy with the monastery as headquarters. For years they flourished, robbing travelers and even swooping down on Chinese cities across the border. The name of Corsa Lincoln was known throughout the East as a place of terror. Between attacks, the High Lama and his priests made a mockery of the religion of Buddhism that they were sworn to uphold, and they built a huge caricature of Buddha, all in black and with the face of a demon. Then went the legend. As they dedicated the great statue to the hordes of the mountain underworld, the Lord Buddha himself appeared in the sky and stretched his hands over them. The vast multitude of robbers fell to their knees and lifted their hands for mercy, and Lord Buddha, the gentle and merciful, gave them mercy. His voice rang through the mountains like the winds of heaven. Live, live unharmed, but live in fear, it is written. Buddha, so went the legend, had then vanished. A great wind sighed through the valley, and bolts of light flashed from heaven. It grew black, black as the darkest night, and when the blackness cleared and the wind died, new mountains stood where the high lama and the multitude had been the lamas who had remained faithful to the teachings of buddha labored to build a new monastery and as the years passed they heard mutterings in the earth then one day a repentant lama who had been one of the multitude came forth an old man the high lama and the robbers still lived he said but they lived in the blackness under the new mountain in vast caverns where no light ever came. And there were things in the darkness, things they could not see, but of which they were terribly afraid. As Lord Buddha had said, they lived in fear. The little group was silent as Chada finished reciting the legend. Then the Hindu boy added, Of course, this is long ago, so very long. Maybe it is only a story and maybe not. The monks of Corsa Lincoln do know there are big caverns, and they know of this black Buddha. I know of it myself, but more than that I do not know. And it is from the caves of fear that the heavy water is presumed to come? Zircon finished. That is quite a tale, Chada, but how do we get to the caves of fear? The entrance is somewhere in the cave of the black Buddha, Chada said. At least that is what the monks have told me. Also, they showed me how to get there. But I did not go in. He shuddered a little. Who knows if the old High Lama might not be waiting. I thought better. I wait for you. Rick felt the weirdness of the tale, too. But he made a joke. I didn't think hobgoblins would frighten you away, Chada. Chada didn't smile. People who live in the East do not laugh at up couples, Rick. I was just trying to be funny, Rick apologized. Well, what do we do now? We look in the caverns for the source of the heavy water, Zircon stated, and the sooner we start, the better. Chada, have you seen men with water bags heading out of here? Men with anything at all suspicious about them? The Hindu boy nodded. I have seen such men. Once I saw ten men going up the trail to the outside with such bags. The bags were all they had. I am sure the bags had heavy water. If not, why so many? Zircon told him of the plastic-lined bags they had found and of their suspicions. Chada saw the implications instantly. He grinned. We find out plenty more about these water bags, you bet. I think I go right now and find out if any more men with bags go by today. He hurried off, getting into his monk's costume as he went. Rick watched him go, shaking his head with admiration. He's a wonder, he said. I'll bet Bradley thinks so, too. Anyone would, Scotty agreed. He gets things done. Wish I could say the same for us. 
All we've done so far is travel while he did the work. Why don't we get busy? Busy how? the scientist asked. Couldn't we look into this cave tonight? I don't see that waiting until morning will help much. If it's a big cave, there won't be light in it anyway. Rick thought Scotty had something there. He pointed out that plenty of lights were in their packs, and that they had the dark light camera. Besides, Hobart Zircon thought it over, then agreed. There's another advantage, he said. Starting out tonight will attract less attention. We got here about dark, so the people of the area don't know we're here. They'll know in the morning, though, and we'll have a thousand sightseers hanging around, unless they're greatly different from the other eastern people I've met. And the less anyone knows about our interests, the better. Sang nodded agreement. That is right. By morning, many people will come to see the strangers. I doubt if they have seen very many white men before. The Chinese guide paused. But I don't know if I like the idea of going into strange caves while it's dark. As your little friend says, anything is possible in this part of the world, even hobgoblins. We wouldn't want you to come anyway, Sing, Rick said. He looked at Zircon for agreement. It would be better if you took care of our equipment and sort of acted as rear guard. We'll need someone to stand by in case we don't come out of the cave again. Afraid the hobgoblins will kidnap us? Scotty asked. Not hobgoblins, but if the heavy water is there, some of Long Shadow's men will be too. We probably can take care of ourselves. Only suppose they catch us by surprise. Zircon agreed. Rick is right. And even if there is no one in the cave, there remains the possibility of accident. I think we'll do well to leave Singh here. Then, if we're not out in twenty-four hours, he can take steps to get us out. That's wise, Singh nodded. They were debating what to take with them when Chato returned. He reported that some of the llamas had seen men with goatskin water bags late in the day, men that they knew to come from outside the valley, traveling from the general direction of the cave of the Black Buddha. It was such water-carrying groups that had made Chato sure that the cave was the source. There was no other nearby place that was possible. That settles it, Rick said. He told Chada what they had in mind. Chada glanced at the sky. Moon in a little while, he said. With no moon, we could not even get there. Too rough. But if no clouds come, we can go. Rick was a little surprised that Chada hadn't objected in view of his apparent dislike of the whole idea. Then he realized that the little Hindu boy wasn't made that way. He might be afraid, but he would go. That was true bravery. After some discussion, they decided not to take their full equipment, but merely to use the trip to locate the entrance to the Caves of Fear. Once the way was found, they could return and load up with gear and provisions. However, each of them took a few emergency rations, a full canteen of water, their weapons, and flashlights. Chada was given a big electric lamp to carry. Rick slung the dark light camera over his shoulder while Scotty changed his rifle sight for the infrared telescope. The moon was up by the time they were ready. They shook hands with Singh and started off, Chada leading. The way led across the valley at a slight angle, heading toward the river. At first it was smooth going, with only high grass underfoot. Rick was enjoying himself. The moon gave light to the valley center, but the sides, under the sheer mountain walls, were shrouded in shadow. The peaks themselves, snow-capped to the west, were bright. Then Chada cut back away from the river, toward the nearest mountain wall. The way began to get rougher, with hillocks to climb and rocky outcroppings to skirt. Soon they were out of the grassland entirely walking through rock masses. Now and then they went from the moonlight into dense shadow and had to use their flashlights, 
Except for their flashlights, no man-made light disturbed the wild scene. They had been traveling for some time. It was late, and not even a fire in front of a herder's tent could be seen. By Rick's watch, it was almost eleven. It was closer to midnight when Chada stopped. He pointed to a rocky defile. This is as far as I went before. My friend who showed me said the cave is there. Zircon took the lead. Behind him, Rick put his own flashlight away and held his rifle ready for use. Scotty, too, was ready. Chada, crowding Rick's steps, had the big light ready to turn on. Zircon's beam picked out rocky walls that rose for a hundred feet. He picked his way over tumbled rock, the others following. The way took a sharp turn, then came to a dead end. Nothing here. Zircon's light covered the area a foot at a time. There was no opening. Maybe we missed it, Scotty suggested. Let's go back and examine everything on the way. They reversed their steps. All of them used lights now, and the combined beams illumined the steep walls brightly. Take a look at that, Scotty said suddenly. His light was on a pinnacle of rock that appeared to have some sort of opening behind it. He moved in, cautiously, the others close behind. There was an opening, sure enough, where the pinnacle leaned against the main rock wall. There was just barely room to squeeze through. Zircon almost got stuck. Once past the opening, a new trail seemed to open up, and, at its end, an aperture in the rock wall loomed black before them. That must be it, Rick said, and his voice echoed hollowly. Scotty moved ahead to the entrance and flashed his light inside. The beam was lost in the blackness beyond. It's big, he said, and the words rolled around in the emptiness. Rick felt a shiver run down his back. What are we waiting for? he demanded roughly. Let's get inside. The opening wasn't large. Zircon had to duck going in. Rick was right behind him, Chada bringing up the rear. Just inside, they stopped, all lights going. The cave was tremendous. The level rock floor stretched away from them, and when they shot their lights upward, a vaulted dome reflected the beams a good hundred feet overhead. Slowly, they moved away from the entrance, lights busy searching the cave. There was nothing near the entrance but rock, solid and smooth. It was so quiet, Rick thought he could hear his own heartbeat. Then his light beam picked up a green reflection on the far side of the cave. There's something there, he exclaimed. In spite of himself, his voice shook. We'll soon see, Scotty said. Their voices rumbled through the cave, echoing and re-echoing. Zircon gave a sudden exclamation. Chada! Where's the big light? The Hindu boy had been playing the bright beam on the walls to one side. Now he swung it squarely ahead, and Rick gasped. The Black Buddha. It seemed to crouch against the far wall, a giant, loathsome thing of dead black with live green eyes. They went toward it, all lights on the thing, and as they made out more details, Rick shuddered. The Buddha was completely the opposite of every other Buddha he had seen. Instead of the bland, quiet look of peace, this thing had its mouth open, showing sharp ebony teeth. It leered over, a nose like a pig's, and its body was gross and misshapen. It was, Rick thought, toad-like. It quite frankly gave him the willies. His imagination gave it life so that the obscene lips smirked, and almost seemed to drool. Something white at the base caught the light beams. In a moment, they stood before a pile of bones heaped against the statue's left side. Zircon's light swept them. Human, he said. Rick's scalp tightened. Next to him, Chada let out his breath in a sigh that was nearly a moan. In the second that they stood silently looking at the pile of bones, there came a slight sound from somewhere behind the black Buddha. 
Instantly their lights swept in the direction of the sound, until Scotty hissed, Put him out! Blackness flooded in on them. Rick strained his eyes to see, his ears to hear. He tried to control his breathing, sure that its sound could be heard forty feet away. Then he saw a horizontal thread of light about three feet long against the wall behind the statue. It spread upward, slowly, forming a rectangle. Rick watched it, his palms wet on the rifle, as he tucked the flashlight away and gripped the weapon tightly. It was yellow light, eerie as a will-o'-the-wisp, and scarcely stronger. Then, as Rick watched, a shadow rose up in a black narrow path from the bottom of the rectangle. It rose and rose until it almost filled the frame, and the blackness was in the form of a man, almost, except that it was too long, too thin. The four stood as though hypnotized for a dozen heartbeats. Then Zircon came to life. He jumped forward with a great roar. Long shadow! The light vanished, and again blackness closed around them. End of chapter 13